welcome to Every Woman Has a Story on WEBN. Our next guest has dedicated her life to activism and serving underprivileged children in West Africa. We spoke with Umu Sharif to find out where her passion originated and what's next for her. Thank you for joining us today, Umu. Thank you so much for having me. So let's yeah. dive right into this. Um, at what point in your life did you realize that you wanted to be a social entrepreneur? Huh, that's a really good question. Um, I would say ever since I was a child, um, I've always had compassion for um, helping others and what really, um, what really became a motive was just me seeing um, how children were um, struggling in Guinea as far as like um, not being able to like, afford school, well, their parents not being able to force, you know, um, school fees to like send them to school or seeing kids running around barefoot, all those things. I think it came to the point where seeing how people live their life and how different my life was, but my life was um, compared to theirs really was a shock to me and I felt like at some point I must do something about it and you know it just took those incidents to occur in order for me to really feel like hey I mean somebody got to do something right yeah wow well um so you grew up in Kindia yeah in I grew up in Kindia. Guinea which is in West Africa yeah. and um tell me a little bit about your childhood you mentioned how it's a little d you grew up differently from other children that you saw mm -hmm. so tell me how it was for you well I grew up differently like I said um, my mom lived here for a little while and my dad was out of town as well um, in Madagascar um, I lived with my grandmother and I was spoiled my entire life um, I never had to go to public school um, I started school um, very young actually and all my life I was in private school until I came to the U.S. in 2003. So, I mean, it's just the simple fact that my parents cared so much about my education and they were just like ready to invest anything in order for me to get the education that I needed. As of other kids, their parents were more concerned about, you know, providing food and shelter for them because, of course, they didn't have both um, means. So. And what are some of the things that you miss about Guinea? I miss the food. Really? <laughs> I miss the food and I miss my family. I just miss that family moment where in the U.S. you don't really get much of that. Um, my mom is always working and we barely have time to like have dinner together. Mm. It's always like one-on-one -on -one <laughs> sometimes, right. um, but not all the time. Yeah. Okay. And so you moved in 2003. At that point in your life, what were some of the goals that you set for yourself coming here? Well, definitely to get a higher education and to go back and make a difference in Guinea. Um, but my main passion was education. It still remains out because, of course, I have to educate myself in order to continue with my um, progress in C with CEA. Um, and another thing was to really get involved and learn more about um, other leaders in the diaspora here because I feel like at just a young age I've always been driven. Um, I've always had, um, you know, a few leadership qualities that, that, I, that I gained from my parents, of course, because they were always like, strong people. They always fought for what they believed in. And being in America, I just wanted to take advantage of you know, every opportunity that was here, because I've heard so many times how America is like the end of opportunity. Um, so I figured some of, you know, some of my dreams will come true, and CEA happened to be one of them. Right. Um, being enrolled out of college, well, from middle school, high school, and then out of college was definitely a big impact in my life, and, you know. That's great. And yeah. what did you study in college? In I Canada? went to Quincy College mm -hmm. where I study paralegal. Um, I gained my associates in paralegal actually this year and I currently enrolled um, at UMass Boston studying um, human services. Wow. Oh, yeah. That's, that's impressive. Thank you so much. So you um, previously described yourself as a compassionate person. You're very selfless. Um, who in your life would you say has influenced that, uh. those characteristics? My mother, uh, my mom was just a beautiful person in and out. 
Um, she's very caring. Um, I remember being back home, other than just like sending um, money for my school fees or whatever. Um, she also took care of the entire family. My mom was the kind of woman that everyone depended on, everyone in the family. Because of course, when you have a family member in the US, a lot of times <laughs> they do think that you have a lot of money. Right. What's she done? Uh, she's a hardworking person. Um, she works hard a lot. And not only that, she believes in giving um, when she works hard, she doesn't believe in just keeping it to herself. And that was one of the things that I truly admire about her and still admire about her. And I wish to be nothing more than her, <laughs> you know? That's wonderful. Yeah. Now tell me a little bit about your nonprofit organization, the Children's Education Alliance. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, CEA is a nonprofit organization that supports um, underprivileged children um, in Guinea, specifically in Kindia. So what we do is provide educational tools, um, small as just a pencil and a notebook, and that goes back to my previous point, how. Um, I've witnessed kids, you know, not having those opportunity, um, whether it was school fees or even having a pen or pencil um, to sit in class and pursue their education. So that's where, you know, CEA's idea sort of like came from. That's where my passion came from. That's what motivated me to start CEA, just to provide necessary needs that, you know, kids truly need to continue with their education. And a small step does indeed go a long of way. Of course, yeah, it really does. It really does. So what are some of the challenges you faced um, as you began to develop your organization? Well, I will say balancing my personal life, um, school, and of course the leadership life as far as like CEA. Um, it, at some point it was really hard because I found myself in the middle of like working on a project or communicating with my um, coordinator in Guinea and I have homework to do and <laughs> you know I gotta run errands for my mom you know but I think um, all it takes is determination um, it takes a lot of patience as well um, when you're doing these things you sort of have to um, sort of have to just go for it. Um, you don't think about the challenges because um, those come along, but you know, it is supposed to be challenging. Um, anything that's worth having, where CEO of course is worth having, is so wonderful. Um, you know, just to work with a group of compassionate young adults like myself, just fighting for a cause that's, you know, truly important to all because education is everything you know it is the best weapon like Mandela had once said rest in peace so yeah okay and so did you have any advisors or mentors to help you along the way yeah definitely I have mentors um, Saran Kaba Jones from um, of Face Africa mm -hmm. that's a nonprofit organization as well that advocate for clean water mm -hmm. and I have um, another mentor Natasha Guet um, she has a nonprofit organization as well that's based on empowering um, young, of a young African adults and her organization name is US Africa Synergy and I have Aisia too as well who's another mentor and the Full for one is my mom, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, her being first, of course, but my mom is like the best mentor because, I mean, she's the one that hears me out, you know, any time of the day or night, um, you know, because it, it, it does get frustrating at times. Like I said, just balancing life, school and everything, but, you know, all these four ladies definitely are the greatest gift ever. Yeah, you're pretty yeah. fortunate <laughs> to have them. So, um, you work with a team, correct? Yeah, I work with a team. Okay, yeah. now how did you first encourage people to join and support the CEA initiatives? Yeah. Uh, I'll say it was a little challenging at first because um, being young and coming out where there's like tons of other nonprofit organizations that are way bigger than mine, um, I was struggling with sort of like convincing people you know, at some point, it did work out though. Um, I went to different high schools first. That's where I started, starting with my um, high school, BCLA, where I graduated from um, Boston Community Leadership Academy. Um, did a presentation there. Um, 
with students and stuff, just let them know about the organization. So I just went around, um, you know, letting the words out, um, attending fundraiser events and stuff. But it was still, you know, little challenges in between concerning the fact that I pretty much had to prove myself, you know, being young again could be really tough um, at times. There's good advantages and there's bad ones as well. Uh, when you're young, t people tend to support you a lot more. I have a lot of people who just, you know, they're always there, you know, because they know I'm still in the learning process. I'm still um, trying to get on their level, so they encourage me a lot, which is awesome. But also at times, when you have a young person in this journey, you know, you kind of wonder, is she really serious? So those were some of the challenges I had to face, but all it took was for me to really believe in myself and you know just believe in what I do and just go with that. Okay and so finally in 2012 you had your first fundraiser. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Ah, my first fundraiser. <laughs> I still remember like it was yesterday. Um, I was really nervous at first. Um, I mean here I go you know <laughs> just a younger um, starting this initiative you know, and I really had to gain people's trust, of course. Um, but the event really went great. We had about 50 people. Um, they came in and I just presented CEA's mission to them, um, did a quick presentation just for them to understand where my heart was and where I was coming from and what I'm trying to achieve and stuff. And the crowd was very nice. They were very, um, I mean, they just wanted to support me right away, you know, based on my presentation and everything else that went on. And it seemed like they cared about Africa as much as I do. And that's the most beautiful thing to have a group of audience that isn't only there to listen, but to actually, you know, relate to your story and wanting to like fight for a cause that's important to you as well. And so have you had another fundraiser since then? Yeah, I had another fundraiser back in September 2013. Um, that was a bigger one, actually. Um, I mean, more people came. Um, we raised about $1,100. So oh. I met my goal, <laughs> which was really exciting. Um, 2013, I told myself that by the end of 2014, I will sponsor over 1,000 kids with school supplies, notebook and pencil, and thanks to the supporters and everyone who showed up at that event, that was possible. Well, congratulations Thank you so you. much. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I'm just curious, what are some of the steps, planning, that you need to go through to put together these fundraisers? <sighs> well, it takes a lot, but thanks for the most, thanks to the most, um, hard-working team and volunteers because um, first of all even like to get a haul and all that stuff um, for the event could be a lot stressful because it does cost money but it's all about the team coming together and all of us are young and talented just you know putting all those talents together and making it the best mm -hmm. yeah. and tell me a little bit about some of the people on your team Oh, people on my team, they're awesome. I work with a guy named Taylor. Taylor is a good friend of mine. Um, he's sort of like um, our media person, like as far as like pictures and stuff. I work with a friend named Nadine as well. Nadine is on the administrative side and she's more involved with like event planning and stuff. Um, and myself, I'm just all over the place <laughs> working with them. Uh, and I recently started working with a very, very um, young, hardworking guy called uh, Mohamed Toure. He's my consultant, actually, and he's been like, like everything I wish for. Right. Um, he believes in CEA and the mission, and you know he he's been working with nonprofit organizations in the past as well. So you know, it, I mean, it's just incredible when we, because he lives in Washington actually, but when we oh. do our Skype meetings and stuff, you know, he's always involved, and it just, I mean, my team is just incredible because they truly believe in the mission statement that we have that we have written down on the website <laughs> which is pretty awesome um, it's amazing to work with a group of individuals who 
believe in what you do, you know, and that's where all the um, energy comes from. Yeah. And so um, your work, most of your work is currently based in Guinea. Yeah. Do you at any point plan to expand to different countries across the continent, the world? Yeah, 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 definitely. I'm definitely, um, I definitely do plan on um, going all over. Um, in the mission, we do mention Africa and we said a little about Guinea, but I'm just like trying to focus on Guinea right now, considering the fact that, that pretty much that's where I'm from and I know more about the country um, than the rest of the countries, but definitely. Um, I will definitely go around the nation. That's my goal. That's yeah. great to hear. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and so uh, you have developed relationships with schools across Kindia. Yeah. Now tell me a little bit about how you developed those relationships and where they are now. Well, I have a great coordinator back home, um, Abraham. He sort of like do a lot of research as far as like um, the schools that need the supplies the most. So he goes around different areas just to like talk to the directors of the school um, to tell us a little bit about a little about um, their needs and stuff. So it kind of helps me. Um, one school though that I feel truly connected with. Um, is um, Windy Primary School. My mom graduated from that school. My uncles, my aunts, my entire family graduated from that school. So that truly felt like home, you know, and it feels really great to give back where um, you were raised. And I felt like Windy. Windy was literally like across the street from where I lived. It wasn't that far. Um, and it was just really great to know that I, you know, my team could um, make a difference over there. And so do you often go back to kind of see the progress you're making or is that something that you track from over here? It's something that I track from over here for now, but I truly do plan on going back very soon. Um, but of course, I'm in school now and I have a lot of things going on here as well. But I will be there definitely at the right time. And so has it been a little challenging to, you know, follow up with the progress there seeing how far away you are. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> difficult, but um, thank God for Skype. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Thank God for Skype. Um, and I do um, call my coordinator as well. We communicate over the phone, emails, and Skype. So that goes along pretty well. And I truly uh, trust the coordinator there. He's as passionate as the rest of us here, and he's just very hardworking. And again, he believes in a mission statement as well, and that's what makes the job you know, easy. Mm -hmm. And have you had any feedback from, let's say, the parents, the children you're helping? Yeah, yeah, it's always, you know, I get emails all the time from the school directors. They're just like really happy. Um, you know, they're very appreciative, which I really love about people who work at the school there and the kids too. Um, when you go on a website, you actually see photos and like how these kids are smiling. It, it, you know, it's just an incredible feeling. It's truly an incredible feeling and that makes our job so much easier. Okay, yeah. and do you have any new projects that you're currently working on? Yes, I have new ones coming up, but it's a secret. Okay. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I'll share the secret with you maybe. Well, well, my goal before September, this is a secret, right? <laughs> <laughs> my goal before September is to raise about 5,000 notebooks and pencils. I'm really excited about that. It's a new campaign that I'm working on right now, and it should be out soon on a website and Facebook and all the social media. That's yeah. wonderful. <laughs> and are you going to do, I don't know how much you can tell me, but is this going to be done through donations? Or are you going to have another fundraiser? Actually, this is going to be very different. Okay. Um, this is going to be, I'm thinking about having a, you know, I'm thinking about just having opportunity, you know, to even get kids involved. Yeah, so my goal is to go um, around different high schools or colleges and just 
ask everyone to give me one pencil and one notebook. That's it. Wow. Just one pencil would just be there in front of you. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, That's just so original. one pencil and one notebook. That's it. No money, no nothing. Just one pencil and one notebook. That's good. Let's see how many people we could reach out. <laughs> And have you had any previous experience in um, nonprofit work? Yeah, yeah, this? I have. I have volunteered for um, different nonprofit organizations like um, Brazilian Immigrant Center and AK Foundation, Progressive Organization for the Women of Africa, and like a few more. Yeah, wow. yeah, those definitely helped me a lot in the long run. Yeah, and did it teach you anything about how to run? something like this yes because I mean those people I worked with are the most hard-working people ever and it's just so incredible to just seeing them do what they do and one thing I have learned from them is to believe in what you do and you just see it through their work you just see it right through you, you know you, when you see them working when you see their work or when you visit their website you know, just the ways they talk about the organization, you can just tell that they believe in the mission so much. And, you know, I learned from that. And ever since, CEA has been everything. It has been something that I truly believe in and see myself pursuing for a very long time. That's good. And yeah. what other qualities would you say a young, driven person who wants to start a nonprofit should have? I will say to have a very clear vision of um, how you want the nonprofit to sort of be, uh, you know, years from now, to be very uh, mindful of um, obstacles that might come around as well, as far as like taking no for no. Um, you know, just accepting the fact that people will reject you, but it doesn't mean that you will give up. So that's where having a clear vision sort of like comes in. Um, when your vision is clear and it makes sense to you, there's no way someone else could discourage you. So I think that's very important. And it's very important to be patient as well. Um, it takes hard work and dedication to truly get the right outcome. And you just have to be patient for that. They just have to keep pushing um, and just Keep doing what you believe in doing because it all comes from the heart. Once it comes from the heart, you know, it's so much easier to just roll with it. All right. Yeah. And now you talked about dealing with rejection. I want to ask you, how did, have you personally dealt with rejection in the past? <sighs> I'll say trying to get my youth involved. <laughs> um, there's a time when... Um, um, I met this kid um, who, I, I mean, I loved his work. I loved everything, you know, he was about. And I really, really wanted, wanted him to get involved with CEA because when I was actually uh, searching for people, not like searching, but like really, because um, I go to fundraiser events, I go to different events a lot, and I meet other young people. And when I notice that they're talented, they're passionate and compassionate about certain things, you know, I would like to get, get them involved because with CEA, I've always dreamed of just like working with young people. I love youth involvement. It's just something that makes me truly happy. But unfortunately, <laughs> the young men didn't want to um, you know, work with CEA at the moment because he had other projects as well. You know, but I did understood it because um, he had his own, you know, projects going on as well. But, you know, things like that, you know, I mean, that's really not a rejection. That's kind of like, um, it's not, yeah, yeah, it's like not the right time right now, which is okay. But, like, I think as far as, like, asking for a pencil, for example, a pencil in a book or, um, donating a lot of times people don't want to donate which is okay um, you can always convince them you know and you just have to show them through your work that you deserve their donation so it's something right. that you could easily overcome yeah okay and to date tell me about one of your proudest moments you know since you started the CEO <sighs> what's what's made you tick what's tell me something well, I'll say raising that much money to provide um, school supplies for over a thousand kids in just like a little period of time, literally just like one night, <laughs> you know, that really brought a lot of emotions 
um, happy emotions though because um, you know there's nothing more amazing than having a goal and having people around who believe in those goals and who help you achieve those goals is just an incredible feeling and after sending those supplies and just the beautiful smiles on those kids face truly just made the job easier it just made me so proud of myself and my team. Um, I mean, it's just an incredible feeling to know that a pencil could make a difference in a child's life. You know, I mean, just a pencil and a notebook. Right. You know, so I'll and say. I'm just curious, do you have any family? I know that you have family in Kindia. Are they by any means involved in? The CEA? Yes, my coordinator is actually my cousin, Ibrahim Sharif. Yeah, he's one of my family members. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. And so, where do you see the CEA in about 10 to 20 years? <sighs> 10 to 20 years from now. Um, I see us having our own school and just and just touching lives, you know, just more lives. Because there are a lot of students who haven't yet benefited from our program. And my goal is to just go all over, you know, all over Guinea, beyond Guinea, everywhere in Africa. Definitely, okay. yeah. And how can people learn about your organization? Um, well, we do have a website, um, and they can go to um, www.africacea.org www.africacea.org. Okay. Yeah. And so I want to talk a little bit about your personal life. So you're doing all this great stuff in the professional sphere. Yeah. And so tell me a little bit about what a typical weekday is like for you. A typical weekday. Um, I love to read. Um, I love to read a lot. And of course, social media. CEA sort of got me into the whole social media thing. I never. I'm still trying to deal with Twitter. I'm not too good with that. But um, I love to read and I love to hang out with friends. Um, but I'm very like just laid back and like reserved. Um, I love grabbing coffee. <laughs> it's like, one of my favorite things. Useful. So instead of like going to the club, I'd rather like grab coffee right. and like, um, you know. And who are some of the writers that have inspired you? Some of the writers. Wow. That's like. Maya Angelou, she remains my favorite always, always, always. And she just why is like, that? I mean, what is there not to like about her? She's just <laughs> amazing. She's so inspirational. Um, and it's just a simple fact that when she speaks, you just feel it through you. And I'm all about what comes from the heart and her work truly does come from the heart. And finally, what do you hope to do with the degree that you have, your associate's degree, and what you're studying now? Who am I studying Will that now? play into the CEA? Yeah, I totally want to go to law school at some point, um, but I also love being on the path of um, um, social entrepreneurship. Yeah, I, I truly love it because um, it's just an incredible feeling when you could just lay your head and just know that you made a difference in somebody's life. And, you know, I just want to be remembered as a girl who, you know, um, made something out of herself and then gave back, you know, to where it needed to be which is Guinea, um, where I'm from, because I truly do love my country. Um, it made me who I am today. And So what you do is quite a huge task. You have a lot to do. Um, do you ever get nervous at any point with what you do? Um, yeah, I do get nervous a little. Um, I do get nervous about um, just putting the right work out there, uh, whether it's planning an event, I have to make sure everything goes right because of course um, people do tend to respect you based on what they see and what they hear and you know through the work you do so it's really important um, to always put your all into it and always always keep it professional um, so yeah I do get nervous. 
Yeah. Just keep working on yourself. Yeah, definitely. All right, Umu, thank you for joining us thank today. You it was so a pleasure much. to have you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much. What an inspiring interview. Thank you for watching Every Woman Has a Story on WEBN. We spoke with Umu Sharif. If you would like to be a guest on our show or know anyone who would like to tell us their story, please email us at ewhastory at gmail.com. I'm Eunice Onwana.